Good to see everyone. Glad y'all are in worship today. Uh, if you're a guest with us, we're especially glad that you're here, and we um, hope that you have a good experience of worship today. Um, if you would fill out the, um, the guest visitor cards that are there in the pews before you, let us know how we can uh, be in contact with you. We'd love to share about our church. Um, if you have prayers, um, then we would love to be in prayer with you as well. We all come to worship with things on our hearts and things on our minds, and so if you would like to share that with us for prayer, we would appreciate that. Um, you can fill out the prayer cards that are there before you in the pews, uh, hand them to our ushers in a moment in the greeting time or after the service, and we'll be sure to be in prayer uh, with you in those matters today and in the days and weeks ahead as well. Um, let's take a look at our calendar of events. You can take a look in the insert. I'd like to highlight a few things um, coming up this week and, and coming up in general. Um, one is tomorrow, no, not tomorrow, tomorrow's Monday, Labor Day, happy Labor Day weekend. Um, but on Tuesday is Methodist men and Methodist women. Uh, we kind of had our, our um, August get all back together kind of meetings. And this is when we're starting to get into our regular meetings for the year. So the women will be here. The men will be at Texas um, uh, Seafood and Steakhouse. Um, a word about Methodist men and Methodist women. If you are a man in the church, then you are in, you're a Methodist man. And so you're invited to come and to fellowship with us. We eat, uh, we kind of share uh, business about things, projects that are going on uh, for, uh, for our organization and share a devotional. And it's a good time together uh, for the women, um, similar kind of format. And if you are a woman, you are a member of Methodist Women. So you're invited to come and to participate. Um, Tuesday night, seven o'clock in both locations. So uh, please do that. Also, uh, Handbell Choir is back this coming Wednesday, starts back. Um, as I said before, if you um, would like to learn a little bit about handbells and if you just wanna hang out with a bunch of fun, rowdy people, then from what I hear, handbells is a good place to do that. Um, but seriously, um, you don't need to have any prior skill. Um, just come and be interested in learning and having a good time in fellowship, and I'm sure they'll take it from there. And also, um, choir practice is at 7 o'clock, so handbells at 6, choir at 7, and of course, youth is back, um, started. It's 5.30 to 8. Uh, the junior high come at 5.30. Uh, there's a meal in the middle at 6.30 when the senior high show up. Uh, so junior high are done at 7, and senior high are, are from 6.30 meal, and then their meeting is afterwards 7 to 8 o'clock. So that's how, um, that's how that works. A um, couple more things. One is September 18th is our church conference, um, which is a meeting of our, all the members um, of our congregation. Um, we've got a lot of folks who are um, regular attenders and a part of the congregation, and we've got folks who are members who've joined on the membership role. This is a meeting for all the members of the church. Um, it is regarding our affiliation for our denomination. Uh, we discussed this a lot over the summer to kind of be in a period of discernment about it. Um, and at the conclusion of that, our administrative council um, voted to recommend that we um, have a church conference to vote for disaffiliating from the United Methodist denomination and voting to affiliate with the global Methodist denomination. Um, basically, our... Um, our thinking process was um, how can we be affiliated with the denomination in such a way that it aligns with um, our convictions and beliefs and values going forward for our future. And so that's the administrative council's recommendation. And, um, and so we need everybody to be there. We're gonna do it at 1130 following the worship service. Um, so if you're a member of the church, please make a point to be there. Everybody be prayerful about this as well. It's an important, uh, important, um, time in the life of the church. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns or anything like that, please contact me at the church office um, and uh, let me and share those with me. Um, I'd like to just be a resource for the church as we, as we handle that and move forward. So September 18th, following worship service. And then the second date to keep um, on your uh, radar is September 25th. That's the following Sunday. And that is Pumpkin Patch Unload Sunday. Uh, we will have pumpkins arrive. We are scheduled for a one o'clock delivery. Uh, if anything changes with that, we'll let you know. But otherwise, plan to come up to unload. Um, I know from talking around sources that we'll have help 
uh, from community folks as we've had in the past. We've kind of got our game plan set up for that day uh, and for the week or two ahead of time, getting our decorations out and getting those um, set up and put together and that kind of thing. So there's a lot that's going into it and all those wheels are in motion, um, but save that date for September 25th. It's a lot of work, but it's also a fun time to gather together as a congregation and uh, get it all set up and ready for the community in the weeks ahead. All right, that's our announcements. At this time, let's stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. stand for the call to worship. Um, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? For in the day of trouble, he shall keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter and set me high. Please join in the opening prayer found in the bulletin. Almighty God, you are always to be praised with grateful hearts. You teach us your ways and lead us in paths of righteousness. Renew us in your spirit that we may seek you with our whole hearts and love you with our whole lives. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Please follow along in the hymnal as we sing Standing on the Promises, page 374.
may be seated. As we come to our time of um, preparing for uh, the Lord's Supper, um, which we'll celebrate in a few moments in our um, worship service, we want to begin by um, reminding ourselves that this table does not belong to our congregation. It doesn't belong to our denomination. The table belongs to Jesus Christ. It's his table. And so the invitation is offered to all who've gathered here this morning. You don't need to be a member of our church or any church. You only need to hear and desire to respond in faith to the invitation of Christ. Would you turn with me in your hymnals to page 12? The invitation is this. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us be in prayer. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As forgiven and reconciled children of God, let us be bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we want to acknowledge our offering. Um, we have the opportunity to participate in what God's doing in our church through our giving, um, through our offering box in the back, or through our link on our church website and our church emails. Um, thank you for your generosity, and um, we pray for continued um, generosity and blessings uh, from the congregation as we give in response to what the Lord has done for us. Um, let us pray. Oh God, we are grateful for your provision in our lives and for the opportunity to be about your work in the world. So give us generous hearts like yours. Receive the tithes and offerings that we bring. Bless them and use them to build up your kingdom through the ministry and work of our church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, may be found on page 881 of your hymnal. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Kids, it's your time. Please come forward for children's moment. animals in my bag. Do you like stuffed animals? No? Okay. So they come in all shapes and sizes, and animals are my favorite. So I want to show them to you what I've brought. What did I bring? A bear. That's right. I brought a bear. All right. And I brought a giraffe. Yeah. Okay. Uh-oh. I brought my other animal. Lainey, can you help me find him? I think he's a sheep. Can you help me find my lost sheep? Where is my lost sheep? <gasps> I found him. There he is. There's my lost sheep. Okay. All right. So, thank you so much for helping me find my lost sheep. I would be very upset if I thought that one of them was lost forever. 
So this reminds me of a lesson that Jesus taught a group of religious leaders one day. The religious leaders were very upset that Jesus, hey CJ, was often associating with sinners. He even sometimes was caught eating with them. The religious leaders did not like that at all, and they were very critical of Jesus. Jesus told them a story to help them understand. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep, and you lost one of them. Wouldn't you leave the 99 who were safe and go and search for your lost sheep? And when you found the lost sheep, wouldn't you joyfully put it on your shoulders and carry it back home? Wouldn't you be so happy that you would tell all of your friends about finding the lost sheep? Imagine that all of the religious leaders had to agree that they would go and do just as Jesus had suggested. Then Jesus said to them, in the same way, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. The Bible teaches us that we are like lost sheep and sometimes stray away from God. That makes God very sad, but he never gives up on us. He keeps searching for us and calling for us. He wants to draw back us back into his arms. He even sent Jesus, his son, to save those who were lost. Aren't you glad that God doesn't give up on his lost sheep? Yes. I am because I was once lost, but now I'm found. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, you are the good shepherd. We are thankful that you came to save those who were lost. Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, John, as always. Um, Laura called in sick yesterday, and so um, we appreciate um, Shirley and Bill stepping in to help lead and for the choir just taking it and rolling with it and everything, too. So appreciate uh, everything you do. Oh, there we go. Our scripture this morning is Genesis chapter 15. You're welcome to turn with me uh, in the Bibles, then your pew, or if you brought a Bible with you, uh, or on your phone. It's okay to take your phone out and worship if you're looking up a Bible passage. Um, uh, we're continuing in our series called The Story of God, where we're um, basically moving through the Old Testament and New Testament to kind of get a picture of the grand sweep. Uh, so often we get a picture of one particular section or somebody's stories or verses here and there um, but sometimes it's important every once in a while to get it get the the kind of the grand sweep of the story of the bible uh, as it begins with genesis 1 as it goes and points to jesus and as moves all the way through to revelation and so um, accompanying the series is a, uh, a just a bible simple reading guide if you don't have one i'd invite you to pick one up at the back um, today and join us in that but Genesis uh, chapter 15 is where we are for today, so let's take a look. Hear the word of God for you this day. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. 
But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come, up, come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, with Abram rather, and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kadam, Kadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. I think that's all the ites. This is the word of the Lord, um, the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, we give you thanks for your word made flesh in your son Jesus Christ and for your word in the scriptures through which you reveal yourself to us. And we pray in these moments together that you would speak your word, that you would write your word upon our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit at work among us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in November 1983, a poppy, kind of catchy song came out uh, from someone who would go on to be one of the greatest, um, uh, have like the greatest uh, selling, one of the greatest selling artists of all time, Whitney Houston. And the song was, How Will I Know? Now, if you're old enough to remember that song, then now you've probably got that in your head for the rest of the day. So I'm sorry or you're welcome, whichever applies to you. But it was a song um, that and Whitney Houston just fit it so well where she just kept wondering about this boy who she saw, who she thought was just so fantastic. And she fell in love whenever she saw him again. And she would sing back and forth to herself in the chorus, how will I know if he really loves me? How will I know? You can't trust your feelings. Love can be deceiving. How will I know if he really loves me? And she just went on and on and on. And that was the song. And it was part of a couple of her early songs that really launched, launched rather an amazing career that she had. But one of the reasons why it seems to me that that song caught on so well is not only because it had a catchy tune and a really fantastic voice and a new artist singing it, but also because there's something about the how will I know question that is really deeply inside of us. It is a deeply human kind of question. How will I know? We get tired and fatigued of ambiguity. We can only take it for so long. Some people are more comfortable with things being ambiguous and gray and some people really need it black and white quickly but everyone gets fatigued at some point if we can't settle what's going on and how do I know it's a basic human need we think about it when we say how will I know if the job interview is going to go all right how will I know if this um, new work position is going to work out. How will I know if um, I'm going to like retirement as much as I think I'm going to like retirement? How will I know if what I'm doing with my children or grandchildren right now is going to be an investment that ends up coming to fruition with a good relationship later? How will I know? There's so many things that we can think of 
to wonder, now how will I know that this is going to turn out in a way that I hope for or in a way that is really for the best? How will I know? That's the question that grabbed hold of me in the passage this morning. Just reading back through it again, I see there's so many things that we could look at in the passage, but the thing that grabbed hold of me most was Abram, it's hard not to call him Abraham, although his name doesn't get changed for a couple more chapters. Abram says, how can I be sure? That grabbed hold of me because that is a deeply human need, to be sure of something. Now, to just kind of remind ourselves of the background, Abram has gotten up from his uh, homeland where he was raised. He has moved all of his flocks and herds down to um, the land of Canaan, current day the land of Israel. There was a famine in the land. He got up. He went down to Egypt uh, where the fertile Nile uh, region, they had food, and so he was able to survive that. He packed everything up, came back. Um, he and his nephew Lot uh, figured out how they were going to live and all that land together, but with all the flocks and herds that they had, they had, you know, um, not enough land for how many animals they had, so they kind of had to find a way to split up and make things do there. And Abram has just been kind of going along, you know, continue to have flocks and herds and build things up and have family, but he still doesn't have an heir. He's got servants, he's become a very wealthy man, in all the other ways that you would account for it in those days, except that he doesn't have a child, he doesn't have a son to be his heir. But that was part of the promise. That was part of the promise of God. And so God comes again and he says, Abram, I am your shield, your very great reward. And here's the thing. I am going to make your descendants great in this land. I mean, if you could count the stars in the sky and the sand in the shore, that's how great your descendants will be. And Abram has said, hey, I've got no one to be an heir in my household from my flesh and blood. I'm, one of my servants is going to be my heir. Abram is kind of solving God's problem for him. Have you ever had that experience where um, you felt like the Lord led you to something and it's not quite where you think it's going to be yet and so you start to think of ways that maybe you could help the Lord along with uh, how he was going to play things out. Um, now sometimes we're called to take responsibility for the things that we're capable and responsible of and sometimes um, we just start to try and fix it and arrange in things when God has already got a plan for how to lay things out and we need to be obedient but we not, don't need to get into fixing things for God. Abram is in that latter, latter category. He's not just taking responsibility for the things that he's capable of being a part of. He's starting to kind of get in and try to fix things for where he sees that God hadn't quite delivered yet. So the Lord reiterates the promise. And it says that Abram believed and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. That's an important verse because Paul's going to talk about that in one of his letters. But it says he believed, but then he also said, now how can I be sure? How can I be certain? You ever had that experience? Lord, I believe you, I trust you. I really do with my whole heart. And how can I know for sure it's going to work out? Anybody have that? How can I be sure? Abram believes God. He believes that God can do it. He believes God will do it. But he just, it just there's that lingering piece of, I don't know if it's doubt or what. It, maybe it's just hard to live in that uncertainty for too long. How will I know? How will I know, God, that your promise really, really will come through? God has made us promises too. We say yes to Jesus Christ. He has made a promise to us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will put his Holy Spirit inside of us to lead us, to guide us, to show us his ways. 
Now, we've got to be obedient and follow, but he will do everything and, and allow us a place so that we can just walk faithfully in his way. We won't be free from struggle or challenge, but we will always have the Lord with us to guide us through the hardships of life, to comfort us, to strengthen us, to give us courage, to help us um, face the future unafraid, to give us a hope and a future, to give us an abundant life filled with his grace now, to give us the resources to work through uh, reconciliation, to work to restore our lives, to, to have him to tap into, and past this life, we will be with him in the life to come. We've got heaven and eternity with the Lord as a promise as well. The Lord has made us promises. And you and I might find ourselves saying, Lord, I believe. Now also, how can I be sure that this is going to work out? How can I be sure of this? And the Lord's answer to Abram for how can I be sure is a good answer for us as well. It's instructive. To really understand what the Lord's answer is to Abram, we need to get a little bit nerdy with the Bible for a minute, though. So I'm going to ask you to kind of follow along with me, okay? Abram gets the animals, and he, um, he cuts them in half. This is one of those places in the Bible where it's, a, you know, it's probably good. It's not a picture book kind of section that gets picked up for that. Um, but he cuts the animals in half. The smaller animals he doesn't, but he, it's a sacrifice. And so he, he puts the pieces apart so that there's kind of a pathway in the middle. Now, anybody who's reading this, and Abram who's doing it, knows that the Hebrew word for covenant, when we make a covenant, the literal Hebrew word is to cut a covenant. That's what it is. In English, we'd say we make a covenant with somebody. But in Hebrew, it says we cut a covenant with somebody. And the reason for that is it's not just a figure of speech. It's because to make the covenant, to cut the covenant, you have to have an animal sacrifice. And so they cut the covenant. And Abram knows what part he's in. That's the first thing we need to understand is that to cut a covenant means that there's an animal sacrifice involved. So that's what Abram does. He sacrifices the animals. He lines them up just the way that everybody knows you ought to do that. So he's got everything set up the right way. Now here's the second thing we need to know to really understand what happens here in this passage. We need to understand um, that covenants in the ancient world, particularly in these days, but we can see it in other respects as well. This will make sense to us. Uh, essentially are between two kinds of parties. One is when you have a stronger party and a weaker party. And the other is when you have two kind of equal um, level kind of parties as far as what their uh, power is in the situation. Now in the ancient world that looked something like this. Egypt, which is a really big power, or Babylon, which was a really big power, um, they had a pathway between them called what we know now is the land of Israel. Why was it a pathway? Well, because it has a river and some lakes and because there's the Mediterranean Sea on the other side. So you can kind of have water for your journey and you're not out in the middle of the desert trying to cross that to get from one place to the next to trade or things like that between those two really big superpowers. Okay, so sometimes the superpowers would make a covenant with the ones in the middle and say, listen, we'll let you keep being your own nice little country there, but when we come through, we're going to need you to uh, feed and shelter uh, us on the way. And in return for that, um, we won't just bulldoze you and make you part of our country. Okay? Sound like a good deal? And the small country said, that sounds fantastic to us. Let's do it. So they would cut a covenant. The stronger party is going to do something. It's going to expect something from the young, weaker party. Complete obedience. No questions asked. But it's going to get something in return, which is protection. The right to keep on going, to do your thing. Okay, So there, that's kind of that one. The other one was if two weaker parties 
think if they get together, they maybe can keep the stronger party from just marching through and taking their food and shelter all the time. Well, let's band together and see what happens. So sometimes that happened too. So in the case of Abram and God, what kind of covenant do we think this is, right? This is a strong and weak covenant, right? <laughs> no questions asked. God is the stronger party. Abram's the weaker party. He's the one who's getting the benefit of the Lord's protection and covering, and the Lord's making promises to him of what his benefits will be. But here's the thing. It requires obedience on Abram's behalf. Are y'all still with me? I know we're getting nerdy and we're staying here for a little while. And to cut a covenant meant that when they cut the animals in half and they lined them up, that what would happen is the, the weaker party would walk back and forth in between that trench kind of area. And it would recite to the stronger party, the bigger king or whoever, it would recite the terms of the covenant. It would recite what the blessings were going to be for if they obeyed and were faithful in the covenant. And they would recite what the consequences would be if they were not obedient and not faithful and didn't keep up their end of the covenant. And basically, that cutting a covenant was um, uh, one of the most serious object lessons you could ever come up with. Because what the weaker party knew was if we're walking in between here and I don't keep up my end of the covenant, I can just look to the right and look to the left and see what's going to happen to me if I don't keep up my end of the bargain here. Very serious. A good way for that stronger party to let the weaker party know who was boss and what was going to really go down. So Abram has everything set up. He's got the covenant, uh, he's got the animal sacrificed, he's, he's ready to cut that covenant, he's got it down, he already knows about the Lord's blessing, and he's had the, the um, kind of gumption to say, now how will I know that we, I'm really going to have an heir, that this really is going to be all mine and my descendants one day, how will I know? He's got it all set up and ready, and the Lord comes to him in a vision. It says he kind of went into sort of a, a dream, and the Lord, he hears a, a prophecy about what's going to happen over the next few hundred years and generations. How they'll go into Egypt, how they'll be enslaved, how the Lord will punish Egypt and redeem and save them out and bring them home here. But you will have a good, you'll die at a good old age, Abram. Don't worry. And something interesting happens at that point. Because now we know how covenant work, covenants work in the Bible. Now all that's left is for someone to go walking up and down between the pieces, right? And who would that someone be? Abram. Abram's the one who's got to keep up the covenant or else face the consequences. But instead, there's a smoking fire pot that comes through and passes between the pieces Abram perceives it oddly like a dream. He's not walking in the middle. It's something else. Now, what might we think that that fire pot is symbolizing? Whose presence is that walking up and down? It's the Lord Almighty himself. Now, here's the amazing thing. That God says, here's what I'm going to do for you. How do we know if someone's if, if we can believe somebody. Well, they give their word and we look and see what they do, right? If we've ever needed to hire somebody for anything, we've said, well, what are they saying that they can do and how believable do I find that? And then what did they do to let me know that I believe what they say? That was not at all Abram's place to try and say to God, now, I don't hear what you're saying, but what are you going to do to prove it? However, God said, let's make a covenant. Abraham gets it all ready. But the Lord's presence goes between the pieces. What's he doing? What's he saying? He's saying, um, Abram, I am going to be so faithful to you that I ensure this covenant. And if you break the covenant... If you, the weaker party, are the one who breaks the covenant, I will still keep the covenant 
And the way that I will keep that covenant, because this is how covenants work, is that I will put myself on the line for the consequences of the covenant. So if you sin and are disobedient, I will take the consequences of the covenant upon myself. That's how um, unbelievably gracious my word is to you. But you've already connected the dots, haven't you? Right here in Abram. Here, just in the first few chapters of Genesis, we can already see the scripture story pointing all the way to Jesus. We gather around a table um, every month. We gather around a table where Jesus came and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Just like the Lord taught Abram, when he makes a covenant, when he makes a covenant promise, he breaks all tradition and he puts his own, him, his own self on the line. That's how good his word is. He calls us to obedience and he calls us to faithfulness. When we respond in faith to him, he puts himself on the line. And when Abram and when everyone else after him, all the way down to you and I, were unfaithful and disobedient to the Lord, when we broke our word and when we turned away from him, he refused to turn away from us. He came to seek and to save the lost, to find the lost sheep who'd wandered away. He came and he put his very self on the line in Jesus to take the punishment for disobedience to the covenant in himself through Jesus' death on the cross. Our question how can we know, how can we be sure is the same question that Abram asked. And God's answer is the same. I'm backing up my word with my own self. That is the greatness of his love for you and for me. That is the sureness of his promise in Jesus Christ. All we need do, all we need do is say yes to what Christ has done for us. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks that when we turn away, you still are faithful. When we're uh, disobedient or unfaithful, you cannot be unfaithful. You simply can't. You remain faithful. Lord, we thank you with humble hearts that you have given yourself to make the covenant good. And Lord, I pray that as we approach the table this morning, we would do so with renewed inspiration and depth of gratitude for your grace in Jesus Christ. As we approach the table, I pray, O oh Lord, that we would commit ourselves or recommit ourselves to your saving grace and that we, we, we would resubmit ourselves to the leading of your Holy Spirit and to the work of your Holy Spirit to come and to make us faithful followers of you by your grace at work within us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in your hymnals again with me to page 13 as we continue in our celebration of Holy Communion. If you will join me there at the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of the bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would those who are serving, assisting in serving communion uh, come forward at this time? The table is ready. Will you come at the direction of our ushers?
have been saved by grace, go forth to be a people of grace in his name. Christ, we have peace with God. Go forth to be peacemakers in his name. we have been given a future with hope. Go forth to be a people of hope in his name. Amen.
Christ, we have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Go people forward to be a people of love in his name. Amen. Would you join me in your bulletin in the prayer after receiving communion? Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our closing hymn on eagle's wings. Now go forth with this blessing and benediction. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit at work within you. Go in the peace, the power, and the presence of Christ to be his witnesses. Amen. <laughs>